yeah, I noticed that it's always terribly difficult to compete uh, with uh, Christoph introductions. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Uh, but first of all, thank you, Chris, for this incredible, Christoph, for this incredible introduction. Thanks to Rachel Carson for having us here, allowing us to work um, in this uh, climate of very exciting intellectual exchanges with all the wonderful people who are here, but also in a friendly and warm atmosphere. And now, with further ado, I'm going to take you to the heart of our story. This La Machina de Yanon is the machine of hope. This machine can help solve an ongoing environmental conflict between the Mayan community of Yucatan and the Mennonite community, which since 2001 has been growing genetically engineered soy. This soy has been heavily laden uh, with pesticides and is uh, held responsible for the problems of Yucatan bees. But this agriculture uh, is only the latest stage of uh, many centuries of progressively industrial agriculture, which has led to deforestation, decrease of biodiversity, and marginalization of Mayan community. Uh, since the first uh, centuries of colonization, 17th and 18th century, uh, large plantations of agave, sisal, and sugar encroached on Mayan communal lands. And in the beginning of the 19th century, in uh, 1847, led Mayan people to take up arms and stand in defense of their lands and their way of life, uh, leading to what's known in history as Yucatan War of Castes. Mayan revolution was crushed but its spirit has been well alive. Uh, it been awakened, for example, in 1994 in the Zapatistas uprising, when NAFTA again seemed to threaten Mayan land tenure. On the other hand, industrial revolution kept progressing, becoming progressively more and more toxic, especially since the Green Revolution and even more since the agribiotechnology revolution, contaminating uh, more and more heavily with pesticides, soil, water, and human and bee health. And since 2001, when this GE soy has been planted in Campeche, um, it also led to an incredibly fast intensification of deforestation. And you can see here Mennonite uh, land and deforestation. So in 2011, the Mexican government uh, really authorized a much more widespread planting of GE soy crops all across the Yucatan region. In that same year, 2011, shipments of honey that were meant for export to Europe were rejected uh, at the port of departure in Mexico. Uh, and the reason given was that the uh, that there were levels of transgenic pollen found in that honey that were uh, prohibited in the European Union. I would like you to remember that this honey uh, was actually coming from Apis mellifera honeybees, which uh, uh, originally came from Europe to the United States and then were brought to the Yucatan region in the late 19th century. Uh, it's important because honey Apis mellifera honey uh, is the prime source of income for Mayan beekeepers in the Yucatan region. As you can see here uh, on this slide, uh, the Yucatan region over here uh, is a major contributor of uh, Mexico's place in the world honey market uh, as one of the leading exporters and producers of honey. That's why Mayan beekeepers uh, play a very important role in that um, industry. So these Mayan beekeepers, uh, actually since 2010, were noticing um, increasing deaths of their Apis mellifera honeybees. And they blamed these deaths on the agrochemicals uh, that were accompanying GE soy, and also the deforestation, increased deforestation that was uh, coming with GE soy. The deforestation was leading to reduced 
uh, sources of nectar and pollen for, the, for their honeybees. Allegedly, the Mexican authorities did not take any action in response to the mine beekeepers' complaints and reports. And uh, this led to the beginning of a social movement initiated by mine beekeepers who enrolled international and national activists uh, as well as uh, uh, honey exporting businesses and scientists uh, to form networks of uh, non-governmental organizations, NGOs, such as uh, Ma OGM, which in Yucatec Maya means say no to GE crops. So Ma OGM, uh, like NGOs, uh, deployed sophisticated social media campaigns, legal campaigns and educational campaigns. Uh, and they also leveraged the research of their scientist allies to refute Mexican government's claims that the transgenic pollen uh, found in the honey had nothing to do with GE soil. So the scientists refuted that. Uh, and these actions led uh, the uh, state of Yucatan to ban uh, any more planting of GE soy in 2011. And uh, following further actions, the state of Campeche uh, also imposed a moratorium on further planting of GE soy until uh, there was a appropriate community consultation that happened with the Mayan communities. Now, these community consultations also involved uh, Mennonite uh, community representatives and Mexican government representatives. And in some instances, they turned violent. And so these exchanges were interrupted. Uh, and in that context, uh, Luis Arturo Carrillo, about whom we'll be talking about, an activist with Mao Jian, uh, worried that, uh, uh, that Campeche will lift that moratorium eventually and that each soy planting will happen again. Mm -hmm. So because uh, the sellers of GE soy pesticide packages enroll mostly Mennonite farmers in this area, the activists decided to attempt to convince Mennonite growers to abandon GE soy. They begin an action of uh, lectures about agroecology that they gave in Mennonite villages. And after one of the lectures, two farmers, Franz and his brother, came to talk to Luis Arturo and told him that they wanted to abandon pesticides, but they didn't know how to do it. This conversation gave rise to an ongoing friendship and a collaboration uh, in an effort to transform the farm of France into agroecology. There was nothing but challenges. <laughs> First of all, how to fertilize. So there is an organic fertilizer called Bokashi, many of you know it. But in order to mix sufficient amount of bokashi to just fertilize one garden, you need two men working most of the day. So what to do with five or 20 hectares, which is an average size of Mennonite a farm? So then Luis Arturo did research and he found on the internet a machine actually designed in Germany that does it mechanically and can produce a huge amount of uh, bokashi in a very short time. But this machine cost a lot of money and the activists didn't have the money, so they decided to do it themselves. And that's the way that La Machina de Yanon came to life. They constructed it from bits and pieces of old agricultural machinery on the basis of diagram that they downloaded from internet. But of course, this is just the first step. Um, while we are talking, Franz gets up and he brings this bottle and tells Luis Arturo that he couldn't resist but throw some of this stuff into the field which they destined to be their organic garden. Because as the seller told him, it doesn't do any harm. And as we are looking at, the, at, the, at that bottle, this is paraquat. Paraquat is one of the most dangerous pesticides, carcinogenic and forbidden in most parts of the world. Um, so, as you can see, in this um, quasi-utopic enterprise of building an alternative agriculture, there are many, many small and large failures, but it is also a necessary enterprise, and it involves building alliances not only between humans and technologists, but also with non-humans. Because let's remember that the effort of building this machine has been motivated by the desire to protect bees. 
At first, it seems that these are the Yucatan bees which are bringing the cash crop and profit to Yucatan beekeepers. But as we are traveling through Yucatan and talking to many people with Thai, we are realizing that the deeper reason is different. That in fact, what everybody, all these activists and beekeepers are working and trying to protect is a different interspecies alliance. Or in fact, a, number, a couple of them. Namely, the alliance of Mayans with sacred sustenance agriculture called Milpa and with their sacred uh, stingless bill, bees called <coughs> meliponas. Uh, but before we take you there, we would like to place the, uh, this chapter of our work in the larger scheme of our book. So, we are proposing a different framework uh, in which culture is an interspecies phenomenon that is constituted by human alliances with plants, animals and other forms of life. And in building this conceptual framework, we are hoping to tell a different story about resistance to GE economies than those that have already been told. And we are also noticing a number of sui generis uh, attempts of transformation in rural agricultures, <coughs> which we call interspecies re-existence. This is a concept coined by Walter Mignolo, Hispanic Studies scholar, and he defines it as network of discourses and strategies aimed at decolonization of Hispanic world. So we adopt, we adopt this concept and we open it to include in it non-human participants. Our book has three parts. The first part is about Argentina and Paraguay and uh, two uh, alliances uh, one of the uh, um, business farmers with GE soy and the other unlikely alliance with, uh, of the um, activists fighting against GE soy with weeds, weeds which are uh, covering fields of genetically engineered soy. And this chapter is forthcoming in uh, the November number of Environmental Humanities if you want to take a look. And the last part of our book is going to be about alliances of Ecuadorian and Peruvian farmers with potatoes, quinoa, and amaranth. And today? We are talking <laughs> about uh, relations between Yucatec Maya people, milpa plants, and melipona stingless bees, uh, which we are conceptualizing together as a symbioculture, which in this sense is referring to the Paired relations between Maya people and Melipona plants, uh, Melipona bees, and Maya people and Milpa plants, this intersection and uh, kind of totality of alliances uh, we are seeing as a symbioculture, Melipona, Maya, Milpa symbioculture. Um, uh, and in the symbioculture, what's important to note is that uh, the connections with non-human life forms are sacred and also uh, part of a subsistence economy that is preferred over a commodity-oriented uh, economy of capitalistic accumulation. So we are making our way with Luis Arturo Carillo uh, from the meeting with um, Mennonite farmers in Hopel Chen. And, uh, Luis's pickup truck takes a side road uh, toward a meeting with an association of Mayan beekeepers. Luis said to us that he was taking the side road because he didn't want the Mennonite farmers to know about his work with the Mayan beekeepers because of tensions between these two communities of Mayans and Mennonites. <laughs> As we entered the uh, room of this meeting with the Mayan beekeepers, we, we were struck to, uh, by seeing that most of these uh, people organizing in a movement uh, who are leading the movement were women. Uh, and as the conversation unfolded with these people, with the Mayan Bee Keepers, uh, about the struggle against GE soil uh, that they were undertaking, uh, we were also noticing a gender-based division between uh, men who were tending to be in charge of the Apis honeybees, Apis mellifera bees, 
and women who tended to be uh, taking care of Melipona stingless bees at home. But it was, the, it was the Melipona Maya beekeeper women who were uh, leading the st strategization. And as this uh, planning for uh, the G soil resistance unfolded in our presence, we also noticed that the struggle uh, seemed to be more and more related with fears uh, of losing the Melipona bees, fears of losing their forests, and fears of losing their milpa. So let me say a few words about milpa. Milpa is a, a form of subsistence agriculture that's been practiced since pre-Hispanic times uh, and continues to be an integral part of uh, Yucatec Maya lives today. Um, at its core, the milpa consists of a series of successional stages that uh, are going from uh, a plot of land on, on the left that's cleared in the forest using cutting and uh, controlled burning. And that plot of land, no more than four hectares, is then planted with uh, mixtures of seeds of maize, mainly consisting of maize, beans, squash, uh, and some other crops, just sweet potato, to form a polyculture. Okay? So two to four years of that polyculture that's replanted. And then uh, the land is left fallow for uh, about three years, following which um, nurse trees get planted in that plot. Okay? And as the nurse trees grow into a secondary forest, so this forest garden to forest um, uh, part of the slide, uh, th there are, there's flowering of shrubs and trees, and beehives are brought in to make honey. Uh, and the secondary forest then also gets used for a variety of other resources, including medicines, timber, um, etc. So this milpa cycle uh, continues to be a core of various <coughs> Mayan lives today. And it's not only a, a technology or a, a technological system of food production, but also uh, a foundation of a plant-based vision uh, of life, uh, in which planting becomes a, a sacred moment uh, when soils, uh, plants and humans come together to turn those seeds in the soil uh, into uh, plants for the future generations. Mm -hmm. Talking about seeds, um, hardly anyone among scholars know more about seeds and their relation with um, human society than Birgit Müller, who, whose uh, articles we read before we went to do our research in Mexico. And she talks about seeds as um, equipped with agentivity. Uh, she sees them as mediators of relationships and of power. She also writes about how seeds allow people to reflect on the state of the world and uh, project themselves into the future. We couldn't agree more. Uh, in our work on Argentina, we wrote about how genetically engineered soy seeds uh, transform not only the countryside, but also social relations, education, and values transforming, for example, the relationship with corporate technology into the measure of success. We also wrote about how Paraguayan peasants tried to regain the land that they had rented into GE soy growers, clean it from pesticides, and replant it with native seeds because they believed that in this way they were regaining their future, which seemed to have been lost in the midst of GE soy economy. But it's only when we arrived to Mexico and we, uh, that we discovered one other attribute of uh, seeds, namely the role uh, of guardians of future of indigenous people populations, as in the seminars of exchange of seeds, um, and of uh, thousands of years of agricultural knowledge. Um, then we discovered that uh, two scholars, Toledo and Barrera Basols, wrote a book about it, and they called this uh, mm, role of seeds as guardians of, bio, of uh, knowledge um, a biocultural memory. And biocultural memory obviously is again an interspecies phenomenon. It is formed um, between uh, a plant or an animal and human population. And it is manifested 
as uh, likes and tastes of particular foods or smells or situations. And it is very often expressed also in myth of origins. Many of you know that uh, Mesoamerican people um, are, have been or were <laughs> created by gods several times and they never came out right until gods had the good idea of using maize mass to shape their bodies. Only then they functioned. So even in that myth of origin, um, there is a very strong interspecies relationship between uh, maize and uh, Mexicans. Uh, maize appears as nothing less than the mother of Mexican people. And because of that, today, uh, connected through maize between the indigenous people with Mestiza people, stand together as children of maize, fighting against the advent of genetically engineered maize, which, as they told me, for them is a question of to be or not to be. Because they know, through networks of alternative globalization, uh, what had happened to indigenous populations in Brazil, uh, Argentina and Paraguay when their lands uh, got surrounded by genetically engineered soil. A sort of agrocalypse, if I can allude to the title of recently screened movie. They also know that uh, with the genetically engineered maize, their food will be gone. And the food is, according to the indigenous people's activists, precisely the way that the biocultural memory with all this technological knowledge is being transferred from one generation to the next. As one of the indigenous activists tells me, with the first part of bites of tortilla that the children take, or even with the first sip of the milk when they feel the taste of the maize in the milk of their mothers. These relations with maize and maize-centered milpa would not be possible or would not flourish, we can say, without insect pollinators and their role uh, in pollinating the milpa cultures. Uh, and prime among these insect pollinators are melipona stingless bees. Uh, Maya's historical alliance with stingless bees uh, forms an integral part of the Melipa. Mayan communities have developed sophisticated melipona culture techniques of manipulating and nurturing uh, melipona colonies, uh, and these practices predate Hispanic times over 3,500 years. As you can see on the left uh, of the slide is Amus and Kad, uh, who is the god of bees, and so this is a, a melipona god, and melipona's are revered. Uh, in this culture, and, and the bee god is, is the guardian who brings life, uh, uh, diving down from Axis Mundi, which is the tree of life. And so this bee god, uh, who's bringing and breathing life into the Mayan world, um, is, uh, is a significant part of the epistemology and cosmology of Yucatec Mayas. Many of the practices of Meliponi culture uh, uh, that started uh, millennia ago are still practiced to this day. Uh, for example, we visited uh, uh, a meliponari in Ichek, Campeche, uh, where these uh, melipona hives are uh, housed in hollowed out log hives, uh, such as these, uh, that, are, um, that are called hobones, and they are brought from the forest and sort of nurtured in, together in this meliponari, and a single log hive can, can live up to 40 years or longer. So, um, such practices continue to this day. Um, what uh, the Mayans uh, revert uh, these melipona bees for are especially the honey uh, of meliponas, which is uh, a central part of rituals uh, uh, of uh, Yucatec Maya, uh, and also uh, a very important medicinal uh, uh, substance that's used for almost any ailment. Um, as well, of course, as a sweetener. Called Shunan Kab, Melipona bees um, bridge Maya worlds with their milpas. Uh, Kab in uh, Maya, Yucatec Maya, means not only uh, bee, but also means world, uh, suggesting that there is a um, very deep 
connection between the social worlds that Melipona bees constitute in their beehives and the social worlds that Maya communities are in. And when bees' lives are threatened, Mayan world is threatened. So the, the progressive displacement of, uh, uh, of Maya worlds interconnected with Melipona and Milpa worlds that Kasha uh, already alluded to, uh, this progressive displacement in the context of colonization and neocolonization uh, has been further accelerated by the uh, establishment of uh, Apis mellifera and um, Apis beekeeping, uh, especially since the 1950s when uh, the Mexican state authorities pushed Mayan uh, communities to adopt uh, Apis beekeeping as, uh, as a model uh, of uh, uh, um, commodity-oriented exchange that would bring them their cash and income. Mayan beekeepers resisted uh, this replacement of Melipona culture uh, by using apis bees to keep Melipena, Melipona bees. Okay. And so there was a, a sort of uh, parallel, two uh, parallel economies running for a, for a while where you have the cash economy of Apis beekeeping that's providing income to then uh, have the symbioculture, the subsistence economy of Milpa and Meliponas uh, going. Okay. And this sort of parallel uh, coexistence continued until uh, everything went down with uh, the, the intensification of GE soy and the uh, contamination of Apis honey. Uh, and the increase in Apis deaths that GE soy has brought. And so we can see that the very market forces that brought apiculture to the Yucatan region are now destroying apiculture okay, and in that sense are threatening the uh, Melipona uh, Milpa relationships of the Maya. So in this context, uh, it's been interesting that past enemies, Apis bees, but also Europeans, European colonizers, uh, have become enrolled as allies in efforts to revive Meliponian culture. For example, uh, Fundacion Melipona Maya uh, is a French-based NGO in Tulum, uh, which started as a conservation uh, group focused on the biology of Melipona bees. But now they are working very closely with Maya communities around Tulum uh, and trying to uh, um, revive Meliponi culture in these Maya communities as a way for the communities to produce and sell their Melipona honey to European markets. So uh, we have to keep in mind though that uh, uh, these uh, sorts of uh, efforts, well-intentioned efforts to uh, improve the plight of Maya communities can turn into civilizing performances of science and capital. Uh, for example, uh, the Fundastra Melipona Maya has been very intent on changing uh, Meliponi culture practices and uh, moving uh, beekeepers to use box hives, which is on the right, as opposed to log hives, uh, toward ramping up the uh, scale of production of Melipona honey okay, and also to quote unquote improve efficiency. So uh, we have to be cautious uh, of these efforts. Um, that said, um, there are multiple forces at play. And the Melipona Maya Milpa symbioculture, in the face of progressive exploitative models of agriculture, has enrolled. Europeans and mestizos uh, into new partnerships and alliances for a uh, sustainable future of the Zimbabwe culture. And so we have uh, uh, Stefan Palmieri, uh, of the director of the Fundacion Melipona Maya, uh, saying, I'll quote, we need the indigenous people to relearn our relation with 
nature. So, and in this sense, you can see that the uh, Europeans who may, who may be coming to, uh, who are coming to make these alliances with the Mayans, uh, are thinking of rescuing these communities as a way of rescuing themselves from imminent climate collapse. So we agree that politics, economy, land tenure, uh, and technologies uh, are the principal factors of transformation of uh, Hispanic agricultures. And uh, talking about technologies, we should talk also about the future technologies. We don't have the scope in this presentation to do that. But we believe that the stories of these transformations can be enriched if we consider um, <coughs> what Birgit calls agentivity of the non-human participants, uh, such as, in our case, uh, maize seeds and uh, melipona bees, carriers of biocultural memory and of hopes for a future, an alternative future that would be different from the one where toxic monocrops constitute a uniform reality of the planet. And in our up-to-date research, uh, we are finding out that interspecies uh, alliances uh, constitute a significant factor in resistance to genetically engineered crops. For example, the fact that in Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, parts of Brazil, they have managed to occupy in 10 years close to 50% of cultivable land, while in Ecuador, Peru, and Mexico, they have received a considerable pushback uh, from the activists uh, fighting against the advent of these crops may be connected to uh, different interspecies alliances in these countries, which are also connected to different land tenure and, in, we argue, which are also connected to different role of indigenous populations. Um, such as, for example, um, in Mexico, the alliance between maize and uh, indigenous people and Ecuador and Peru between uh, potatoes uh, and quinoa and uh, farmers, uh, they led to the formation of particular social and political formations, groups, which uh, managed to uh, resist the advent of genetically engineered crops. So we believe that telling stories which give protagonism to these non-human actors of agricultures will attract your attention to the significance of searching for alliances not only among humans and technologists, but also plants, animals, and perhaps other materialities. Thank you. <laughs>